So I was actually wondering just from a systems level perspective, what would the effects of this type of future, even if not all of the plastics can be derived from non-petroleum sources, what would the effect of this future have on the environment and fighting back climate change just in general? Well, you know, I mean, if you look at our raw material feedstock and you look at where it's produced in a field in Brazil grown on sugarcane, that's an incredibly closed system, much more so than, say, growing corn in North America. In a cane mill in Brazil, you've got a fermentation facility that's co-located with the sugarcane mill that makes sugar. And that sugar goes to feed the fermentation system. You might also make ethanol with it. When those two plants are co-located with one another, all the power generation from those two plants goes from cogeneration that comes from burning what's called the sugarcane, the gas, the stocks. After you extract all the sugar, you use that to generate power. So that power runs the two facilities, the fermentation facility and the sugarcane mill. The excess power goes back into the grid. So you put more power into the grid. But Beyond that, the, the nutrient cycling between those two plants and the sugarcane field is a very closed loop. The fermentation water feeds back to the sugarcane mill. The steam feeds back to the sugarcane mill. If you're doing ethanol production in the sugarcane mill, the, what's called the venas, the supernate that's left over after ethanol fermentation, that goes back into the cane fields to fertilize the cane crop. Super, super efficient process. You don't get that from an oil refinery that pulls a barrel of oil out of the grid. So, you know, you've established this loop. When we get to our, you know, polymer chemistry and our fabrication piece in, here in Salt Lake. So Checker Spot is a B Corp. According to bcorporation.net, certified B Corporations are, quote, businesses that meet the highest standards of verified social and environmental performance, public transparency, and legal accountability to balance profit and purpose, end quote. And one of the things we're very focused on is, is sustainability. Well, when you build a pair of skis, you know, if you just look at the mass balance, what's the mass of the raw materials I put in? And, you know, what do I get out in mass of skis? It's about, uh, you know, one to one. You have about one part ski and one part waste. So we have a pretty significant development program within that fabrication piece and the polymer science piece to really significantly reduce that waste output. So it goes beyond you know, the molecular foundry and the sustainability of producing the algal oil. It also hits home on the material science polymer chemistry piece and then the fabrication piece. So how much can we reduce those outputs, that waste in ski manufacture? We've really been making skis for two years, but we've already reduced that significantly in this year's manufacturing by incorporating a different type of material derived from our algal oil that significantly uh, reduces plastic waste, for example. And we have some other parts that we'll introduce into the ski that will significantly reduce raw material usage that go into the ski. So it's taken a really, really holistic approach to how we're doing each and every component. And again, being a certified B Corp provides a focusing mechanism for us to look at all of those. The third example I'll give is, is on the chemistry side. Our chemistry conversions this year, we've eliminated a significant solvent input into one of the chemical conversions that we do on the triglyceride oil. That has a huge impact because all that solvent input went, previously went to waste, and now we won't use the solvent and we won't generate the waste. So at each and every step, if we can just spend the time to look at these things, I think holistically this whole approach can have you know, positive impacts at each and every part of our technology. You know, aside from the, the climate issue, broadly speaking, and, and looking to solve that problem, in terms of the plastic waste problem then in particular, how are biopolymers produced via this method more readily biodegradable or recyclable that would have a benefit in tackling the plastic problem that we face? Or is that perhaps not a benefit in this space? It can be. So we've got, a, we've got an internal initiative whereby we're taking back skis that you know, people buy from us. And part of those initiatives that I was talking about around reducing waste, part of that is looking at the reincorporation of the ski waste streams into the finished product hmm. to reduce raw material inputs. 
So part of that ski buyback program or take back program in the early days is to really provide the raw materials for a lot of that development work. So ultimately, you know, in a perfect world, we would get to this closed loop. You know, we're always going to use virgin materials. And what we want to get to is a point where that waste is absolutely de minimis and where those raw materials are absolutely the minimum. As far as biodegradability, I think you need to be careful when you talk about that. Some people will claim that polyurethanes are biodegradable. You know, certain types are. The types that we generally make, I don't call them biodegradable because of the time function associated with that. Mm-hmm. You're not going to throw these in your compost pile and come back in three weeks and they're gone. Yeah. You know, <laughs> talk about several years, are they going to degrade to a certain extent? I'd say moderately, but I wouldn't be prepared to call them biodegradable. I just, sure. I just wouldn't say that. So the question is for us, from a development perspective, can we get to monomers that will give us that capability? And that's mm-hmm. certainly something that we're absolutely thinking about. That's really cool, especially from the just recyclability and you know raw materials to that output and trying to minimize that input there. So from the polymer industry perspective, shifting away from sustainability, what impact do you foresee this technology having on the rest of the polymer industry? Do you think that some of the methods that you're using could be applicable for processing of other types of polymers? Oh, I think so. And, you know, look, the polymer industry, again, you know, super smart guys, they're in a business, right? And they're going to be very sensitive to price, which in our case is going to be driven by scale. And so, again, to make inroads with those folks, you know, you can't have something that's, you know, $500 a gram. You know, they're going to deal with things that are, you know, maybe their high-end stuff is, you know, $10 or $20 a kilo or something. That's very high-end, maybe niche for them. But, you know, their commodity-based materials might be a dollar a pound, a lot of them, right? And so you just need to find where's the sweet spot at this point that you could get in to those types of materials. You know, historically, there's good precedent for triglyceride oils being commodities. They are today. Uh, You Mm -hmm. know, look at palm kernel oil or palm oil, you know, $700 a metric ton, 70 cents a kilogram. Very cheap, very inexpensive. (laughs) Uh, why Why is that? Scale. Are there negative consequences to that, environmental consequences in the case of palm? Sure. Yeah, there are. So there's trade-offs, you know. This organism and this platform has that kind of capability to reach those kinds of scales and those kinds of productivities. So that part doesn't, that doesn't concern me at all. And the fact that we're able to tailor this organism to make this, you know, these wide degree of outputs... Again, I, I, I liken it back to a barrel of oil. You've got this one thing from which you can derive these many, many, many different types of monomers. 